Thanks, David, for that meditation. There are meditations, and then there are meditations. And um, thank you for being a, the poet who shows up and gives voice to the complications and contradictions of our humanity and of this world and um, in a loving way. And anyway, I was, I was quite moved by what you said today. And yeah, I'm just glad you're here. And uh, yeah, I love you as best as I know how to love, <laughs> really. And yeah, I was... <clears throat> and I'm going to read a poem that involves a grasshopper here. <laughs> And the question of one's wild and precious life. Poems are funny. It's like I started to go to graduate school for creative writing, and then I abandoned ship and went in the religious direction, so you can decide if that was a good idea or not, um, it, even though it might be the same world now that I think of it. Uh, and one of my professors said, you know what makes a good poem, or a good meditation for that matter, is something like this. Is it worth returning to? You know, is it worth returning to? Does it compel you to return to it? Does it sing, I'm adding now, does it sing to you uh, each time you encounter it? Does it change your relationship with it? Um, does it change your relationship with the world? And if the answer is something like yes, then you're dealing with a good poem <laughs> or a good piece of music. And um, So here's Mary Oliver's The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention. How to fall down in the grass. How to kneel down in the grass. How to be idle and blessed. How to stroll through the fields which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Some questions have no right to go away. That's a line from David White. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? It's funny to me that this poem is entitled The Summer Day, and it begins with black bear and grasshopper and sugar and ends with death. Also a definition of a good poem. <laughs> so I'm reading this because I want to talk about really the relational nature of being today. And 
the fundamental reality that we are who we are in relationship to everything else. We are who we are in relationship to everything else. Everything else. Death and black bear and linoleum and um, poems and heartbreak. We are who we are in relationship to everything else, to the forest and to our parents, whether they sucked or not, to the water table, to our DNA. We are who we are in relationship to everything else and to our hormones and dopamine and It's the only one I can think of. <laughs> and to language. We are who we are in relationship to everything else and to our skin color and our bioregion, to sound fancy. You know that Simon and Garfunkel song? Uh, well, I don't know the name of it, but I'm a rock, I'm an island. I am a rock. It's false, you know. It's true on one level that you are a rock and an island in the sense that every, you are who you are in relationship to everything else, but you are in as much as you are in relationship. And, um, but you're not a rock. I think he's being sarcastic anyway in that song. I'm a rock, I'm an island. Because it's fundamentally not true. And we, now, we, know, we, we always knew this poetically, we know this scientifically. Where do you end and where do you be? Where do you end and something else begins? Where does your body end and the bacteria in your body, which is a separate entity unto itself, begin? How much of you is you? You know, it's weird. The universe is freaking weird. So that's my major claim today. You are who you are in relationship to everything else. Another way of putting it is, is, is like this. Um, we are worlds within worlds. I got this line, I think, from Bill Plotkin, one of my teachers. I think it was him. Worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. It's kind of like that. And, um, and I'm, I want to talk about this because my sense is our theme for the month is well-being, and my claim is that well-being depends upon the quality of our relationships, our relationships with all things. I mean, who would disagree with that? Well, you could try, I guess. <clears throat> but doesn't that strike you as fundamentally true? Well-being is really a relational question. You could have everything you ever wanted live in the best house, and all your needs are met, everybody likes you, no traumas and wounds, and if the water table is poisoned, you're screwed. You are who you are in relationship to everything else. It's a world within a world within a world, and your well-being depends upon the quality of your relationships with all things and with as many things as possible, which can feel a little overwhelming, I realize that. And as human consciousness evolves, which I think it does very, very, very slowly, we're coming to see, thankfully through the disciplines of things like science, just how interconnected the web of life really is and how much well-being is dependent upon the quality of relationships with all things. <laughs> That's why a song like I Did It My Way is stupid. It's really, really, really stupid. It's small, it's myopic, it's narcissistic. In the old sense of that myth where you stare at the reflection of yourself in the pond and you fall in love with that as if that is real and not interdependent and interrelated to all things. You can't do it your way. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? What will you do with your one wild and precious life? Well, my suggestion is improve the quality of your relationship with as many things as possible as an act of well-being and solidarity with all things, something like that. I, I thought about St. Paul today as I was driving in, as, as you do. <laughs> He says something quite amazing. 
he says that he's talking about Christ as a, I'm going to tell you what he was talking about. He'll, he would disagree with me, I'm sure. As an archetypal reality. And he's using the body of Christ as a kind of mythic and archetypal reality to, to describe the community as a living presence, not about Jesus. And he says this. He says, if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And you know what? He's freaking right. 100% right. And that's what we're coming into awareness of more and more, or we're ignoring it. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. You know that in your own body, correct? When I cut off the tip of my index finger, wait a minute, ring finger, this is very funny, by the way. I, I cut off the end of my finger in December in a wood splitter, and I drove to the hospital, and I told the people in the hospital I cut off my uh, index finger. And they looked at it and examined I went from the nurse to the doctor, and, and I kept saying it, and they just agreed with me, even though it was my ring finger. It wasn't until my wife came in and said, that's your ring finger. <laughs> I have no idea why I told you that. What was my point? <laughs> what was my point? Where was I going? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. I know what that's like. From a tiny injury. From a tiny injury. It's like I couldn't do anything without some conscious awareness of that reality. Well, that's also true if we extend our awareness outside of the body. When your kid suffers or your friend suffers or, you know, your parent suffers or your friend suffers. and It's not made up that you're suffering too. It's because we're interrelated and interconnected. And that's also true of the very web of life. Everything, everything. When does this end, what I'm talking about? Worlds within worlds, relationships within relationships. There is no end. It's eternal. It's, it's infinite. And the universe is expanding. What the hell does that even mean? That means whatever is, is also just the isness is getting larger, thus extending our capacity for our relatedness to all things, which apparently is getting bigger. What? I don't know what that means. There's a kind of humbling effect. I want you to try to feel what I'm talking about just for a moment. So I want to invite you on a little imagination journey. So I want to invite you to close your eyes. We're just going to uh, be here for a few moments in our bodies, in, our, in the world within worlds within worlds, in our bodies, and just feel yourself not like you know, trying to do anything at all, but just aware of your body here and your breath. Your breath that is yours and not yours. Just the rising and falling of life itself. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Just feeling... the thisness of your own self here. Maybe you can feel your body on the chair, on the molecular entanglement that we call a chair. You know, how is it that you're even, you're really floating in space right now? Just feeling the, your back against the chair and your feet on the floor on the concrete that's holding this place level, which is made of sand and earth particles. Just feel your body again breathing in and out. And imagine that your, your feet have roots of sorts that are connected to the entanglement of earth itself and to the waterways beneath us and the hidden streams and canyons of, of what's beneath in the soil and 
your own body, being made of the same particles of earth itself and of soil and ground and groundhog, those wily little devils in their labyrinth of mazes. Because here you are in your deep connectedness with with the earth because you are the earth. You are the earth breathing the earth and You, you are like Michigan. Yeah, and see if you can breathe in. Take a few deep breaths of the, of the sky that we're moving around in. The same sky that is being breathed by the cardinal and the yellow finch and the grasshopper, the same sky moving in and out of your earthly, feeble lungs as it is their own earthly, feeble lungs. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? And You're sharing breath with raven and with oak leaf and maple and dandelion. And you're exchanging breath with your, (laughs) I know it's the age of COVID and all, but that's what's happening right now. You're exchanging breath with your fellow humans, a kind of sameness about this room. We're just human beings breathing in the air and being supported by the earth, the earth becoming somewhat conscious of the earth a world within world. Yeah, and so just when you're ready, just open your eyes and I was going to say return to the room, but we never left the room, but we did kind of leave the room (laughs) because we're in worlds within worlds. And, And human flourishing... Here's my claim again. Human well-being, human human flourishing looks like expanding our relatedness and enhancing the quality of our relatedness with all things and with one another. I was thinking about a word like inclusiveness, which Pride Month is is, is emphasizing, emphasizes it just in its cultural, as a cultural symbol in the landscape of culture. And inclusiveness is funny because it's more like saying, what's real? That's what it's more like saying. What's real? Well, what's real is that there's a a wild diversity to being. And how, how can I open my aperture and include more of what's real? It's something like that. And I hope C3 is that kind of place, a place of widening the aperture of the worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. And, and I, at least for me, when this process is, is, is happening, I, I can feel like Mary Oliver, I don't know exactly what her prayer is, but I do know how to kneel. It feels like that. It's like yeah, I, I do know how to kneel. I know how to fall down, what she say, in the grass. I know how to pay attention. That's all she's... All right, pay attention to the worlds within worlds within worlds, to the complete inter, interdependence of, of our relational being with the interdependent relational being of all being. Okay, so I have two images I want to share with you this morning that one is um, mo- modern, uh, modern, philosophical, Ken Wilberish, and the other is ancient, because I think we need some help in deepening 
deepening, or I think we need help widening the aperture. That's for sure the case. So much cultural pressure wants to narrow the aperture, you know, become one thing. It's myopic, it's small. Find your group, find your niche, and don't look outside of that. <clears throat> so it's challenging, and so we need some help how to widen the aperture, and how to, how to broaden, how to soften into more relatedness. And so I want to approach it from two, two uh, avenues here. And I'm just like giving you these images and metaphors. One is modern, one is ancient, to see if it might help, help us a bit um, and see if they're still relevant in a way. Okay, so the first comes from Ken Wilber. And when I say it comes from Ken Wilber, I was joking with the pre-talk people that I don't know exactly what that means because almost everything he says is a footnote of something someone else says. That's what he is, is like a walking, breathing collection of footnotes. So Ken Wilber uses the word holon. And holons are very important. I think it's a very important image to deepen our understanding of what it means to be human and what it means to be on this earth and moving in this world. And a holon is really quite simple and also terribly complex. <laughs> the holon is... A holon is this, that everything is whole unto itself and also part of something else or made up of parts. So everything is both whole and part. So here's a simple way of putting it. Let's take a molecule, the amazing molecule, which none of us can see, but we're just going to assume our seventh grade teachers weren't making crap up, all right? So a molecule is a whole. It's a whole thing. It's complete. It doesn't need anything else. It's done. Molecule complete. It just happens to be made up of atoms. Wait a minute. Okay, so it's whole. It doesn't need anything, but it's made up of atoms, which are parts of the whole that makes up the whole that is the molecule. Are you with me so far? And then what are atoms made of? You see where this is going. You know, it's like that, um, it's turtles all the way down kind of phrase. All right, when does this stop? Well, that's the fundamental nature of reality is what, what the whole on as an image is trying to describe. And that's true of your own being. You're both whole and part, all the way up and all the way down. And talk about uh, being put in your place, you know. It, it's, it's a, it, it, it shifts our orientation, at least it, for me it does, it shifts my orientation to a kind of softening, a kind of humility. When was the last time you were controlling any of your atoms, you know? Or just this morning, you're like, time to get up, atoms. You know, I mean, it's like, it doesn't even make any sense. It's like, but, you know, the ego, which is a great gift to humanity, you know, we just carry on like, I did it my way, you know. But you're just a whole on. That's all you are, just a whole on. And, and the whole of you is also embedded in something else, which is embedded in something else, which is embedded in something else. It's, it's, it's a whole... It's a whole on, and I don't want to get, I kind of want to go down this, I kind of do and I kind of don't, so I'll do it just a little bit. Um, so Ken Wilber also says that <laughs> within the whole on of just being human, you also have these four quadrants, eight different perspectives. You have the I, the we, the it, and the its, and you have the internal and external dimension of each of those. I'll give you an example. So here you are. We're... You're just having your, your subjective first-person experience of I right now. There you are, just doing it. I can't see in there. You're whatever, what are you thinking right now? This guy's full of crap. Wonder what lunch is going to be. You know, I don't know. You're, that's you, and you have, you have feelings, and they're internal. And there's a whole universe that's just the I, that is your I, and I can't get into are you tracking with me? But what's amazing about that is you can bring awareness to that. You can say, okay, I am having an experience here. And kind of strangely, you can also look at that experience slightly from the side. That's what Meditation 101 will do for you. 
You can kind of look at it. Well, who is the I having the experience? You can also run it through a scientific lens where you're just a collection of hormones and synapses. That's your I. Well, today I thought this. Well, what? The brain did something chemically? Was that the thought? Do you feel how there's an internal and external dimension just to I? Well, what about we? You're apparently understanding what I'm saying, or at least 10% of what I'm saying, or 90% of what I'm saying. How, how is that even possible? And we can converse that we are mutually understanding some, each other. That would be more of the internal dynamic at work here, in the whole on, inside the we. We can also step out of that and use sociology and anthropology and say, and look at it from the lens of culture and language and, and worldview and religion and all kinds of ways we can. Okay, I'm going to stop there. But I'm just saying, you're a world within a world. Do you know how, here's a funny phrase when you think about it. Here's a common phrase I hear. Well, I just believe, fill in the blank. Well, I, I just believe this. Or, well, I think this. Who is the I? And isn't that I deeply embedded in a relationship with all kinds of things? And by the way, you could say, well, I just think, and through a different lens, what you just think can be false. Well, I just think the moon is made of cheese. I have more evidence that the moon is made of cheese than anything else because I read about it in a book, and it said the moon is made of cheese. I've not been there. I know this is getting a little bit weird, because now I'm talking about the moon being made of cheese, but do you feel how, how interconnected even a statement like I believe is? It's a, it, it requires a relational awareness. And if that relational awareness, if, if we deepen into our relational awareness of the way things are, the aperture can open. And I can get out of believing that the moon is just cheese because the aperture opens as I deepen into other ways of relating to reality. Are you with me so far? That's the whole on. I said, are you with me so far? And no one nodded. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really that hard what I'm saying. It's just it's strange. I would like to suggest that it's important for us to contemplate the sorts of things that I'm describing here and be a part of what we would even call culture and language and education and teaching. I mean, we want, don't you want your kids and grandkids and future generations to deepen into, their interrelate, into the interrelatedness of being? Do you? Well, how? Okay, we need maps and models to help us get there. We need maps and models. We need images. Let's see if, let me look at my notes and see if I said anything I wanted to say about holons. Yeah, what was my point? Well, that we're a set of relationships to ourselves and to the world. What's my point? That we're a world within worlds and this ought to keep us humble. Okay, here's the other one. Here's the other image. Now we're going to go ancient, mythic. See, the ancient peoples, and what I'm about to say I think is trans-religious and trans-spiritual and trans-cultural. The ancient peoples, plural, had a kind of tiered view of the universe. Because they were trying to understand the interrelation, interrelationality of, of all being. And the tiers were fairly straightforward. Upper world, middle world, and underworld. You see this all over the place, even if they have different names for that. Upper world, middle world, underworld. Remember, what, at least what I'm trying to argue is they're trying to understand our relationship with the world. They're not trying to describe um, physical reality. I might even say they're not trying to make a metaphysical claim. They're just trying to describe how do we relate to the world. Well, something like upper world, middle world, and underworld. And so here are my definitions of these things and why I think it's one lens that can help expand the aperture here. You can disagree if you want. So what do I mean by upper world? Well, I mean it with it, what is our relationship with ultimate reality? 
That's, that's how I would put it. What is our relationship with the largest whole we can imagine? Whole as in W-H-O-L-E, that kind of whole. A black hole is an example of trying to contemplate the weirdness of reality itself. Apparently, they exist, and they mess with everything we know about reality. Well, that's a way of contemplating the large, the whole. The other word for that is typically God or the divine or the transcendent. I like to say ultimate reality. That is one of my definitions of God. All you have to do is capitalize R in reality, and that's part what, partly what I mean by God, the whole. And ancient people said, well, to approach that is like approaching the upper world. I mean, you could just feel it, you know? It's like, what is this world? That's the opening question of Mary Oliver. I was just in Utah at 9,000 feet in a new moon. So the night sky had so many stars, you couldn't see the constellations. What is this world? Well, it just draws us to contemplate such a question, and that's, a, that's having a relationship with the upper world. Right? Even though I'm, I'm, I'm trying to provide a large on-ramp here for such a definition. Fundamentalist religions in their various expressions would want to narrow what I'm saying, but they would still say, you need a relationship with the upper world. Am, are you tracking with me? Middle world is exactly what it sounds like. It's like middle earth. You know, it's the ordinary. It's much of what David was, was musing on in his poetic musing. <laughs> Middle world things like linoleum and the ordinary and the messy and the beautiful. Like, also you feel, what is this world? And, you know, I do travel sometimes for work, wilderness programs, Israel trips, other, other kinds of things like that. And um, sometimes when you travel, I don't know if you have this feeling, but it kind of feels like um, it's like a little special world for a little while, like the special world of traveling, and then you come home and it's, I guess, not the special world of traveling, you know? <laughs> That's the middle world. Both of those are the middle world, really, but the middle world is the things that are like, I shouldn't have left all this stuff undone and pretended that it didn't need attention for the last five days. Do you know what I'm saying? That's the middle world. It's, and it's also the role of your ego and your roles and your name and your identity and your job and your proclivities and your gifts and your skills and your, and your cultural background and your intuitions about middle world, middle world, middle world. It matters because it's the place where we're learning our relatedness to the interrelatedness of all being. And then there's the underworld, which is my personal favorite, which is what I'm always, you know, dancing around and dancing with. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the stuff that's hidden. You know, it's the stuff that's hidden. It's the stuff that's hidden from your eye. Well, I just believe. You know, it's... <laughs> um, I was talking with Valerie just before coming in here. And, um, this is kind of a Freudian thing, but if someone, or it's like Shakespeare, I think thee protesteth too much. So when you hear someone saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, you can be pretty sure it's, they're just covering up their doubt. But they're not that aware of it. That's the underworld. They're not aware of it. They're standing on an abyss of doubt that... Their conscious middle world ego has firmly, you know, uh, what's, what's the right metaphor? Tried, tried to pour a concrete foundation between itself and that, the feeling of the abyss. Well, the underworld is where we begin to discover things about ourselves and about the universe, I, I would add, that we don't know anything about, it, but it's down. It's a mythic orientation. I'm not saying it's literally down. You don't dig a hole in the earth, you know, and it's... it's it's a mythic way of thinking about things. But the underworld matters. The underworld matters because, you know, I've already talked a bit about the shadow, but from a Jungian point of view, there are things you don't know about yourself. That ought to scare the crap out of you. It's also the realm of instincts. Instincts you're not aware of, really. They operate. That's more of the underworld. 
the instinctual world, the archetypal world, the world of energies and powers and influences on you and the world, I would say, that are deep in your psyche. So why am I mentioning this? Because I'm asking a question about well-being. Well, if it's true that we live in a holonic universe and that everything is everything is both whole in part and deeply interconnected, okay, all right, that's hard enough. <laughs> and does that seem related to well-being? It does, because I want to understand the nature of relationships and I want the quality of those relationships to improve. Well, the same can be said using the, the lens of the upper world, the middle world, and the underworld. What is your relationship to these things? I'm just going to do a show of hands. Have you ever been to any kind of counseling or therapy? Okay. So you need the underworld, apparently. Yep. So you need the underworld. Yep. It's just having a dialogue with those hidden dimensions. And probably you need therapy after my talk as well. So. <laughs> but what I'm saying is the old wisdom, the ancient wisdom said, for there to be increased well-being on the earth and inside your own person and in the community, you need to enhance the quality of your relationships with all three, upper world, middle world, and underworld. Now, you don't have to buy that. I happen to buy it. I think, yeah, we do need from time to time to fall down on our knees in the grass. I don't care if you believe in God or not. I'm talking about a way of orienting to the larger whole. And sometimes we have to do the hard work of just peering into the black hole of the underworld. And much of the time, we got to get about the business of middle world tasks. Wouldn't you agree? Isn't there some shit that needs to get done? There is. One PS here. And it has to do with Mark Zuckerberg. Now, our friends at Davos, in Davos, World Economic Forum and Mark Zuckerberg, and they'd like to propose to us that we consent to the, to the um, metaverse. I don't know if you saw what the World Economic Forum said about the metaverse in education. This is very funny. Well, I'm telling you it's funny before I say it, so that's not fair that one of the reasons why they want education to live in the metaverse online is because of our young people's addiction, this is a quote, to textbooks and pencils. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I know I've been really struggling with the pencil addiction for a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's just... <laughs> You can't make this up. Now, what I would like to say, I'll try to be brief because I could talk for 45 minutes on my, how uncomfortable I am with the metaverse. But my sense is this. I think technology has a place. And, and you could say of the metaverse, which is a digital mechanized universe, that it sits in a world within worlds. It does. It is fundamentally, fundamentally dependent on lithium, which is uh, something that comes from the earth. Without it, there's no metaverse. So it's a world within a world. It just happens to be a relatively myopic one, in my view. It closes the aperture. That's what I'd like to argue. I don't care what its gifts are. It closes the aperture. And the thing closing the aperture is a corporation which wants to sell you things. I'm not making this up like a conspiracy theorist. I'm saying that's the way it works. And if we've looked at Facebook over the last few years, our addiction to it has narrowed the aperture for most people. I know what we should do. Have all of our children also join the same metaverse. What I'm saying is the whole on, and even upper world, middle world, and underworld blows that out. It, it, it forces us to say, do we want to live with that kind of myopic vision of the future? The problem with that, as your universe gets smaller, like a digital universe, your relationship with the oak leaf is ignored. 
That's what I'm saying. It closes our understanding and our consciousness toward the world within worlds, to the interrelatedness of being. That's, that's what I'd like to argue. I think we are entering the brave new world. And some of us are going to have to sound old-fashioned and be annoying and say, I don't want my kids on screens. All right? That's what we're going to have to say. We're going to say there are dangers here. There are dangers here. Anyway, like I said, I wanted to end with Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I think I'm done. I'll just end with uh, Mary Oliver's final questions here. I know how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day in the metaverse online. Tell me, what else should I have done? Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious interconnected life? Thanks for listening.